So we're talking about roll, uh, roll and MVT, which is 18 on Moodle today. Please go ahead and get that downloaded if you haven't already. Um, also remind you that uh, you've got a little project due tomorrow. Um, you've got uh, a web assigned due tonight, maybe? Okay. All right. Um, that, that's the two things you've got right now. Claire, would you like, Claire, would you like a grilled cheese sandwich today? Okay. Yes, Miss Weeks. Yes, we did 17 on critical points on Wednesday. We recorded it and we sent it out to you. But we're about to review critical points a little bit here. We did critical points that day. No. 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 We did that Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. We, you, we did that on Tuesday. We did. We're, we're about to talk about I do have the video. I'll try to send that link back out to you in case you got, don't have it. But it wasn't a very good lecture. I did a poor job. Maybe today will be better. Okay. 18 is where we're about to begin discussing. Okay. Now, go back in your brain. What do you remember about critical points? What are critical points? Yeah, but that, that's the answer to something else there. Okay, it's where the slope, or in calculus terms, is what? Not slope, we call it. Okay, where the derivative, what? Equals zero or undefined. Okay, that's the definition of a critical point. So when you're asked to find the critical points of something, which you'll be asked to do probably the rest of the year, you set the, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and find out where it's zero or undefined. How's the, fun, how's the derivative undefined? Now, now, but algebraically, how can I look at a derivative and know that it's algebraically that it's going to be undefined? How can I determine it? Zero in the denominator. So only if you have fractions will you have derivative of zero. Okay? So critical points are where the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. That's one of the things we talked about last lecture. Now, we also talked about extreme values. What are extreme values? What do we mean by extreme values? Maximum and minimum. Okay. Now, he used the word uh, local in there. What does local mean? in a certain area of it, okay? So like if we've got a graph that looks something like this, then this point would be considered a local max even though it's not the absolute max, agreed? And this would be a local min even though it's not the absolute min. The absolute min would be over here, the absolute max would be up here. So you can have local and you can have absolute. What real life example, or we used a couple real life examples of this. What do y'all remember about those? Of local max, local min, things. Anybody remember those? Weather temperature. The high today is going to be 82. That doesn't mean the hottest place on the earth. That means locally here. That's what they're expecting. We also talked about gas prices. Local min being the, the minimum price in our area. It might be, it's probably cheaper in South Carolina than it is here. But the local min or the local max. Okay, so we talked about those. We call those extreme values. Now, now, where do extreme values occur? Two places. Okay, which is called a critical points. Okay, they occur at critical points. Or where else can they occur? But if it changes direction, that's a critical point. There's one other place that we talked about they could occur. Critical points and end points. Very good, you mean. End points, okay? So we've got those two things that we need to worry about extreme values. So we talked about this a lot on that day. Here's the big takeaway from all of it. 
whenever you're asked to find critical points or whenever you're asked to find extreme values, take the derivative and set it equal to zero. There's your first step. Once you find your critical points, then it's relatively easy to defeat, determine the extreme values. Let's take an example problem that I'm going to make up off my, the top of my head here. Let's say x cubed minus uh, 3x squared plus 7. There's our function. There's our function, okay? If I want to find the extreme values on the interval 1 to, hold on, let me see, 4. Okay? Our question is what are the max and min on the interval one to four? Okay? So where do we start with that? Take the derivative. Uh, what is the derivative, Mr. Armit? minus 6x, 3x squared minus 6x. So what do we do now? Set it equal to zero. When I set it equal to zero, what do I do now, Ms. Weeks? Okay, and how am I going to factor it? x, let's take out a 3x. And then if we take out a 3x, what do we have left? x minus 2. So what does that tell us? 0 and 2. We've got x equals 0 makes the derivative 0. x equals 2 makes the derivative 0. Do we have to worry about it being undefined anywhere, Jonah? Uh, no. Why not? We don't have a fraction that's going to be defined everywhere. So how do we determine the maximum and minimum on this interval now? Plug them back into the original. So we need to figure out what f of 0 is, what f of 2 is, and the endpoints. We need to find out what f of 1 is and what f of 4 is. Okay? Everybody in agreement with me there so far? Okay, when I plug in 0, what do I get? All right, when I plug in 2, what do I get? 8 minus 12 plus 7, I get 3. When I plug in 1, what do I get? 1 minus 3 plus 7, 5. And when I plug in 4, what do I get? 64 minus 48 plus 7. Question, sir? Where you plug them in again. Yes, I'm plugging, I'm plugging these into the original equation. I'm going back to the original because we know, want to know the function values. 64, did I do that right? 16 times 3, 48, okay. So that gives me 16 plus 7, that gives me 23. Yeah, 23. So what is our maximum? Where is the maximum value on this interval? Here's our max is at 4, 23. Where is our min? 2, 3. Okay? We've done a little bit more work than we needed to. We did not need to do to evaluate one of those numbers. Why didn't we need to evaluate zero? Correct. Look at what our interval is. 1 to 4. Is 0 in that interval? So we really did not even have to do this here. Luckily, it, didn't, it wasn't the maximum in or it could have messed up our answers. But there's our, our minimum value is at 2, comma, 3. Our maximum value is at 4, comma, 23. Okay? And that's pretty much everything there is to know about critical points. All right? You've got a short web sign. None of you have started it yet, but it's relatively easy over just this stuff here uh, that hopefully will not give you too stressed tonight, okay? So now we're going to talk about two new uh, things today. 
One of them, uh, and, and they're kind of related, but I want to start off with this problem. Give me an answer. Yes, no, one of you is right. Oh, what was yours? Yes. Okay. Josh, Josh emphatically says yes. Why? All right, so it's four minutes and went five miles. Okay. So that comes out to be an average of 65 miles an hour, which is right on the edge. And because it's, you're being clocked at lower than the average at both intervals, you've got to be doing higher than the average. Okay. Hold on. Does everybody follow what? Follow Josh's logic here. He says they're sitting five miles apart. Okay? The first officer clocks the truck going 55 miles an hour. Four minutes later, the same truck is clocked at 50 miles an hour. All right? So, in four minutes, what is his average velocity? Average velocity. His average velocity, how do you find average velocity? You've been able to do that for years now. The distance you've traveled, five, divided by the time, four, four minutes. We really don't, we don't normally think of miles per minute. What do we, we think of miles per hour? So four minutes is how many hours? Ooh. Four divided by 60 hours. Are y'all comfortable with that? Four divided by four minutes divided by sixty minutes is one hour. Uh, both of those that would give us two hours. So if we do that, then we get three hundred divided by four, and four going to ooh, really? Three hundred divided by four. Four will go seventy something, won't it? Seventy-five miles per hour. So he averaged. 75 miles per hour in there. Okay? So is there enough evidence? Yes. Okay. Yes, there's enough evidence because he has just proven that he had to be going 75 somewhere in that interval there. What if he stopped? He had to do even faster, right? So there's no way to argue this case here, okay? No way to argue it. He had to be doing it. Okay? We used math. We used what looks to be very simple math to do that, right? And by using that simple math, or just by looking at this simple math, we've looked at one of these two theorems that we're going to talk about today called the mean value theorem. Okay? So this is a, a kind of a, a real-life impact of what we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about the simpler one, first of all, uh, before we get to that, what does it mean for a function to be continuous? No holes. This is going way back in your brain there. No holes. No asymptotes. No jumps. No asymptotes. What does it look like? Right, if once I put my pencil down on the paper and start drawing it, it's never going to stop, right? So that would be an example of a continuous function. Now, the example we just gave with the uh, car speeding, would it have to be continuous? No, he could have stopped in there. Ah, uh, but if he stopped, he had to start back up. Could... He could have stopped and then started back, so it could be continuous. So it doesn't, it, it, he was continuous there, I think. His traveling was continuous. For us to be able to use this correctly, it has to be a continuous function, okay? So let's talk about Rolle's theorem. This is very mathy, but we're going to try to break it down into things that you can easily understand. If f is continuous, Okay? F is continuous on the interval. What does that mean? Continuous. Just a continuous function. We can draw it without picking up our pencil. And differentiable on the interval. Now, what does differentiable add to it? It's got a derivative. You can take the derivative everywhere on the interval. 
What does that mean graphically? No sharp turns. So continuous, that's continuous, but that's not differentiable, okay? So if it's continuous and differentiable, it's got to be something so that it starts and then it's a nice smooth curve and then it ends, okay? It's got to be something like that. So continuous means it's got to be, keep moving, differentiable says it's going to be smooth. And f of a equals f of b. What does that mean? Endpoints are at the same place. Give me a little bit more description of that. Meaning, yes, their y values are the same. So if we're going to look at this, this would be an example of something. This is f, this is a, and this is b. Okay, and f of a equals f of b. So we're looking, if we wanted to draw a function between those two that was continuous and differentiable, draw one. Just on your paper right now, draw a function between these two points, or the two points you just put on there. Draw a function, I don't care what, as long as it's continuous and differentiable. As long as it's continuous and differentiable. Somebody want to, here, go draw yours on the board. Or go draw one, okay? Hamilton, go draw something on the board that doesn't look like hers in a different color, okay? Who else wants to draw on the board? Need a couple more. Go, go Claire, go Josh. Use different colors. Oh, look at there. Some people are just always see it. Look at there. Watch out. How about that? Okay, so we've got all those things. Now, we know all of those are continuous. We know all of those are differentiable. We know the endpoints are the same. What's one other thing all of them have in, the, in common with one another? Well, start at A and end at B. Yep. What's something else they all have in common with one another? Somewhere they have to have a slope of zero. Would you agree with that? Let's look at the green one. Uh, let's look at the green one. We've got there and there and there. The red one, we've got a slope of zero there and there. Looks like right along in there. Right along in there. What about the blue one? All zero. All zero. Everywhere on the blue one. And then look, we've got a bunch of them on the black one, don't we? And that's what Rolle's theorem says. There has to be, there has to be a place where the derivative is zero. There has to be a place where the derivative is zero. Now how does that hold true? How does the algebra of that hold true? Well, let's think about the average from A to B. The average from A to B, how do you find the average of something? Or how would we find the average here? We could say F of B minus, or F of A, even F of A minus F of B over A minus B. That's kind of the slope. Would you agree with that? Well, what do we know about F of A and F of B? They're the same. So what's this top going to be? Zero. So this is just another, it's zero over some number, but more importantly, it's going to be zero. So this tells us that what? The average over that interval has to be zero. If the average is zero, somewhere in there, the actual has got to be zero. Does that make sense? It's got to be. And that's all Rolle's theorem says. If the average is zero, the actual's got to be zero somewhere. Does it tell us where? Does it tell us how many? But all it tells you is there has to be one somewhere. Well, how could this be useful mathematically? Let's see if we can find out how this could be useful. Uh, let's don't talk about mean value yet. How could this be useful mathematically? Let's go over a couple of slides here. Find the x-intercepts of the following function. 
Let's just do that part first. Find the x-intercept. That's something you've been doing since Algebra 2. How do we find the x-intercept? Set it equal to zero. X-intercepts are where this thing equals zero, okay? So x squared minus 6x plus 8. So how are we going to figure out where that's equal to zero? Y'all are going to do it. Factor. So factor it and find out where my zeros are, people. You're smart. Really? Right? So we know where our zeros are. Now, using what we just learned, using Rolle's theorem, what do we know then? We know that f of 2 is 0. We know f of 4 is 0. Those two are equal, aren't they? Well, if they're equal, then what has to happen somewhere between them? The slope equals zero, okay? Can anybody think of why that might be important? The function's got to change direction somewhere there in between them then, doesn't it? So the function's got to change direction. Well, why is that important? Why could that be important? If the function, if we know that the function's going to change the direction somewhere between two and four, why is that important? Well, why could that be important? What's it going to look like then, people? We know, it, we know the function's here. We know the, the function is at these two points, the two green points. What else do we know? So it's, gonna, is it, it's going down. Everybody can agree. So it's got to do that in there somewhere. Would you agree with that? Well, why is that important? We said it was turning in there. So what does that mean? someplace the derivative is zero, so what does that tell me? Can anybody look at that maybe and tell me something else that helps us with? At some place, the function turns. Right around in here, the function turns because this is zero. Can you describe that point to me a little bit more than that? It's a critical point. Okay. Can you tell me even more about it maybe? It's going to be a min or a max. In this case, we know that it's a minimum, but we know that it has to be a min or a max between that. Okay? So by all we can, t what we can say for sure is that there has to be a min or a max somewhere between those two points. So as long as we can find two places on a function that are equal in function value, there has to be a min or max between them. Does that make sense now? Because any function I draw, I mean, if I draw a function and say, okay, over here it's there and over here it's there, that helps you to know what? There's somewhere in between it's got to get to a low point or a high point. It might get to 20 or 30 of them in there. But suddenly when we start talking about our real life examples that we'll be working in a few weeks, this makes a huge difference for us, okay? So we know that the derivative has to equal zero somewhere in there. Because how do we know that the derivative has to, has to equal zero in there? Because they have the same uh, y-axis or um, f of q minus f four uh, equals zero. And to be over q minus four be negative so it ends up just being zero. That's our average. Right. We know that the average of these would be zero. Therefore, the derivative has to be zero. How can we write that up? This is one of those things you need to know how to do. It says show that the derivative equals zero. Did it say find the derivative and, and tell where? It just said show that. So how can we say that? Since f of two equals f of four, and f is differentiable on the interval, two to four. I didn't say anything about continuous. Do I need to? 
okay? Did you say yes? She, you know, she said no, okay? One of you is right. Which one? What if you have, like, uh, a few slides that go up and then you start going up the bottom and go down? Okay. Then it's what? Then it's not differentiable. If it's differentiable, if you go back in your notes and look, we wrote this statement down one day. Yeah, you just thought it right. What? Right. If it's differentiable, it has to be continuous, okay? So since we said it's differentiable, we don't have to worry about continuity. It's continuous by default. Since the function values are equal at the end, it's differentiable. Therefore, by MVT, no, this isn't MVT, this is rho. By rho, F prime of C equals zero for sum C between 2 and 4. That's the statement you need to write if you're going to show that. You don't understand it right now. You just memorize it right now, okay? Claire, Daniel. If you're doing that first you have to write that as well. Yes, you would want to write this down because show that's going to have a justify implied in it. You've got to justify it. So what would I need? What would I need to know? Okay. If this were an FRQ, I'd want to find these two. I would want to show that the show that the function values are zero or the same, and then I'd want to write this blue statement. This statement in black here. Claire Looney. Good question. Should I? What should I use here? Do I have to use parentheses or brackets? Okay. What's the difference between this and this? Brackets include the endpoint, okay? We can't talk about differentiability at the ends two and four, so we would need parentheses there. If you go back and look, it said it was continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, meaning it's continuous at two and four, but it's not, we don't know, it doesn't have to be differentiable there. So what you should write, when you're writing differentiable, be sure you write open parentheses, open and close parentheses. If you're talking about continuity, you would have to say square brackets. Can anybody think of a picture where it would be differentiable, where it would be continuous at the ends, but not differentiable at the end? At, uh, at, two at, at two and four, there was a sharp point. So what if it looked something like that, like a semicircle? Do you all remember when we did the semicircles before where we had this, that's the square root of, no, that's, yeah, that's the square root of 4 minus x squared or something like that. We found out that at the ends it's continuous. It ends there, but it's, we can't find the derivative at those points there. So that's the reason that it's a closed bracket here and an open bracket, uh, uh, open parentheses there. Anytime I'm going to write down differentiability, I'm going to use open parentheses. If I'm talking about differentiability, I'm talking about an open interval. Uh, yes, on the one that's due Thursday. Oh, okay, good question, good question. Is there, a, is there something like this on WebAssign? Yes, but it's not going to ask you all of this. What it would probably do is say, find the x-intercepts, find the function values at the x-intercepts, uh, and find, uh, find where the derivative is equal to it somewhere in there, okay? All right, so that's Rolle's theorem. Any questions? So if it says use Rolle's, what are you going to do? Okay, it's going to give you an interval. You're going to find the function value at each on the interval. Agreed. And what should happen on the function value at the endpoints? Should be equal. If they're equal, you can use Rolle's, okay? If they're not equal, you can't use Rolle's, so you can just be happy and stop right there, okay? And once you know the function values are equal at the end, then somewhere in there, it has to be, the derivative has to be equal to zero in there. Right? Yes, ma'am. Well, like, like, whatever numbers, like, 
Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Does everybody understand what she's saying? She said, we set it equal to zero because we're wanting to know the x-intercept. Could we do something like find out where the function is equal to seven? Yes, just set it equal to seven and then work it out, work out the quadratic. That's right, subtract seven. And, it, you know, the easy thing to do here would be set it equal to negative, uh, set it equal to eight. Um, then you've messed up, okay? Or there doesn't, or, or there's not any one of the two, okay? I can. So, Roll says if the ends are the same, there's got to be a place that the derivative is equal to it in there. Well, what if the ends aren't the same? That's a problem. Let's draw with it. Let's draw that up a little bit and see. Okay. What if we've got a function? There's our function, end point and beginning point. We know it's continuous and we know it's differentiable. What if we know it's continuous and we know it's differentiable? Somebody go draw a function that's continuous, differentiable, and starts and ends at those two points. Or y'all afraid, aren't you? He's trying to trick us. I'll give you one. Is that the only function that's continuous and differentiable between those two points? What else? Go draw one. No one will laugh at you. Okay, it's continuous, it's differentiable. See, it didn't hurt at all. Anything else? Could it do something like this? Or like this? Or like... All of those are continuous. All of those are differentiable. All of them, what do all of them have in common now? They all start at A. They all end at B. They're all continuous. They're all differentiable. What else do all of them have in common? Mm. 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 Slope's not equal to zero. Hmm? Well, I'm, let me draw some lines on here. Hmm. All the way down this black line. On that yellow line, and on that yellow line. What do all of those purple lines that I just drew have in common? Well, that one doesn't, does it? They all have a slope of the most basic function. They all have a, the slope of the most basic function. What do you mean by the most basic function? The black, well, good, good question. So what is this, what's the slope of the basic function? Uh, I don't know, is it one? Uh, not a number. How would I find the slope of the basic function? Okay, so if this is B and this is A, the slope of the basic function, the slope of the black line would be F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Would you all agree with that? So what did we say then about all of the purple lines in? They're parallel to that, which means what? Same slope. So what do we know then? For if a function starts off at A, stops at B, and it's at a different height than it was, if it's continuous, 
If it's differentiable, what has to happen in there? Some way it has to be in there so it's the same speed, so it's the same slope, right? There has to be some point such that the derivative is equal to that. There has to be some point such that the derivative equals that. Does this look strangely like Rolle's theorem to you? What's the difference between, what's the only difference between Rolle's and the MVT? Endpoints. Rolle's, the endpoints are the same. MVT, the endpoints are different. Truthfully, you could use MVT all the time, couldn't you? Because if the endpoints are the same, what's this top going to be? Zero, therefore the derivative equals zero. Okay? But rolls is endpoints are zero. Roll, what's a roll look like? Roll, you think of something circular, looks like zero. That's a good way to remember it. Rolls means you've got a zero in there, okay? MVT, yeah, I'm thinking about bread too, but I'm try, trying to think of rolls like roll, okay? But MVT, the derivative has to equal that. Didn't we use MVT at the start of the day? Didn't this use MVT? Because he started off at, zero, at the place of zero. He ended up at a place of five miles away. He started off at t equals zero. He ended up at t equals four. So there's a, our a. Our, a, our initial point would be 0, 0. Our end point would be 4, 5. And we did 5 minus 0 is 5. 4 minus 0 is 4. So MVT, MVP, uh, MVT is how we determined that this was actual speeding there. OK? It sounds like actually do that to like somebody. Would they? I don't know. Could they? Yes. Seems like it, it, yes, there's a lot of work involved in it. I agree with you. It's a lot of work, a lot of work involved in it. There. But did you? That's actually how the radar, the radar gun works. Did you know that? The radar. What does the radar gun do? It, it does. It shoots a beam to bounce off your car, and it measures how long it takes to get there. It measures the distance that it's traveled and how long it takes to get there, and the distance divided by the time tells me how fast you're going. It's just working really fast in fractions of seconds. There, okay. So. Now, we just talked about two huge theorems and a lot of words, but let's get down to actual what you think of as mathematics. What are you going to do here? Or what, what did we just study that says this has to work? What did we, yes? Rolls. But how do you know that rolls does? The derivative is zero. Now, before we can, we're assuming rolls because the derivative equals zero. Really, before we can say rolls for certain, what do we need to do? What's the first thing we have to be sure of in rolls? Well, we have to be continuous derivative, uh, continuous differentiable, and what? A, f of negative three and f of three. But can, can you look at those and tell me that negative f of negative 3 and f of 3 have to be equal to the same thing? Yeah. Negative 3 to the fourth is going to be a positive number, and negative 3 to the second is going to be a positive number, just like 3 is going to be the same positive number. So since these are equal, find all values of c such that f prime of c equals 0. What do you do? You know what to do. How do you solve that problem? And take the derivative and set it equal to zero. You're going to do that so many times. I mean, that's just got to become second nature to you, okay? If you don't know what to do in a problem, find the derivative and set it equal to zero. Half the time it's going to be right. So find the derivative, set it equal to zero, and see if you can find these points we're looking for.
Is that right? Find the derivative, set it equal to zero. Are all three of those points on, in our in our interval? Is the square root of three halves smaller than three? Yes, it is. Okay, so we have three points in there where the derivative equals zero. So, do you have some idea of what this function's got to look like now? At ne I mean. At negative 3 and 3, if we put those in there, we get zeros. No, we don't. We get 81 minus 27. We get numbers way up top here. We get a number up here and up here. At 0, we know the derivative is 0. And at th plus and minus 3 half, uh, square root of 3 halves. So this function's got to do some w-ing in there. Would you agree with that? Now, it could look like this. Or it could look like this from what we know right now. But it's got to do something like that. We don't know which yet. We'll figure that out a little bit later as we go on, later in the week. Okay? Find the derivative, set it equal to zero. That's, if you take nothing away from today, find the derivative, set it equal to zero. Now, what is this an example of? Well, we look at our interval 1 to 4, okay? If we put, what is f of 1? Can anyone tell me? It's going to be 5 minus 4 over 1, which is 1. And f of 4 is going to be 5 minus 4 over 4, which is 4. So our endpoints aren't the same, are they? So what are we using this time? MVT. Now, is the function continuous everywhere? A while ago, Jonah said we had to worry about continuity if we had a fraction. I see a fraction in that function. Correct. Is the function continuous everywhere? No. Is the function continuous on our interval? Yes. Where is it not continuous at? At zero. Because if I put zero in there, I get uh, undefined. But it's continuous from one to four. So do you think you can solve this problem right here? What does that problem say to do? Take the derivative. Can you take the derivative of five minus four over x? Uh -huh. 